Um, welcome to another session of SC602 uh, nonlinear control. Um, so, what we were doing uh, last time was actually giving you an intro of adaptive control, right. So, I think um, I of course did not go much further. Um, so, there is of course an entire section you can see which is on backstepping parameter unmatched with control. Uh, I did not cover this uh, because again this is not an adaptive control course. But of course, you can see that the examples we were considering the, the control and the uncertainty appears in the same equation, right. So, this is called a matched uncertainty, right. And as you can imagine, these are much easier to handle. All that we did was instead of theta star, we put a theta hat, right. So, again, I did not say that at the time, but uh, this idea that whatever control I get, I just substitute the unknown with an estimate of the unknown is called the certainty equivalence principle. Okay. So, this is very commonly used whenever you hear somebody in adaptive theory talking about certainty equivalence, this is what they mean. They basically design the controller assuming the parameter is known okay. and then in the adaptive control, they just replace the true value of the parameter by its estimate theta hat. Okay. So, this is the notion of certainty equivalence. So, basically you are taking the certain controller and you are creating an equivalent controller. There is no, you never change the structure of the controller and this obviously gives us an easy way of constructing the control of course, right. So, so the idea was pretty straightforward. All we did was we, we again constructed the known case control, right. So, we of course, we did it via backstepping in this particular case, but it does not matter how you do it you construct a known case control and then uh, you you basically replace the theta star in the control by the theta hat right and once you do that you basically add to your lyapunov function a term in the parameter error right so this is what we did so you had this lyapunov function for the system right or the control lyapunov function remember that we need a control lyapunov function or a strict lyapunov function right so you should not even start doing adaptive control without a CLF or, an, uh, or a strictly upon a function. Otherwise, adaptive control is known to fail royally, okay. Not even like you know in small ways, it will basically really damage the system in the presence of disturbances. So, make sure that for the known system, you always start with a strictly upon a function, which is what we get by backstepping. That is why backstepping is so popular. Uh, then we just added a term in the parameter error. Okay, this was the idea, right? And then we did the analysis, and this the purpose of this analysis was to get a update law. We got that. Uh, the really cool thing, like I said, was you don't care where you start this update law. Right? You don't care about the initial condition. It can be anything. It can be as far from the true value as you want. You will still get exact tracking. This guarantees that you get exact tracking. Okay. And that is pretty amazing if you ask me, right, because you made the system agnostic to the unknown, however much it was. So, as you saw with the your typical signal chasing arguments, which is what we did in the end here, we could prove that uh, E1 and E2 both go to 0, correct. And uh, we of course, only could prove that something like this, you know, you only can prove this on the parameter errors, right. So, the parameter errors are not guaranteed to go to 0 unless you have something called a persistence of excitation condition, right. Of course, we did not discuss what is the persistence of excitation condition, uh, that is not part of the plan again, right. But, but finding the parameter is the, so in adaptive control, we do not particularly care about finding the parameter. Our aim is to track and we did it successfully. So, we do not care to find it, okay. But in system identification and also in all learning, all of learning, all of deep learning, finding the parameter is the requirement, okay. And so, in those cases, persistence of excitation is inherently assumed, yeah. Although they may not use those same terms, same ideas or same words, uh, sorry, they may not use the same words, but the idea is the same. Persistence of excitation is required for parameter learning, okay. And that is the crux of it. You cannot, you cannot uh, learn without having uh, this kind of a persistence, yeah. 
but although typically uh, all the learning algorithms are data driven so nobody tries to verify these conditions they just assume you did a good job okay and then you run the algorithm yeah? but in reality if you do want to learn uh, in a true sense you need persistence of excitation okay that's really the key point here so this is uh, what we will do in terms of uh, uh, adaptive control we're not going to do anything more um, what I want to do is uh, start a new topic and that is on constrained control. We want to talk about control under state constraints. Okay. So, a lot of you, uh, until now we have been talking about a lot of scenarios, although we have done nonlinear control design and I hope you have learned some method at least pretty well, but um, we have not seen a lot of realistic scenarios, we have definitely not seen disturbances, but I did say in passing, yeah, we did not cover it, but we did uh, say in passing that, you know, that uh, because we are doing Lyapunov based design, it is naturally robust. In the sense, if you add some disturbances, your system is not going to become unbounded. You are still going to have some kind of bounded performance, which is governed by the size of the disturbances. And in, in a lot of cases, you can even uh, increase the control gains in order to make the residual set. Suppose you are supposed to go to the origin, instead of going to the origin, you will somehow, uh, you know, circle around the origin, alright. And whatever the size of this circle or this set is, can be made, can be shrunk by choosing larger control gains, okay. So this is really the advantage of Lyapunov based design that you are getting robustness for free, okay. It is easy to prove, I am not going to really prove it here, but robustness is sort of something we have already handled, that is why I do not talk about it separately in this course, okay. So you can just blindly go and design a Lyapunov controller for your systems, basic robustness, a bounded noise, bounded disturbance, handled. Yeah, you don't have to you know think about it and worry about it yeah great but the other scenario is that of constraints on the control and constraints on the state okay uh, of course i'm not going to talk about control constraints per se uh, which can also be handled by the way in this using the same methods that i'm going to talk about but we want to talk about state constraints so so if you see one of the issues with nonlinear control is that uh, if you have ever implemented any nonlinear control and we have, we have implemented these backstepping controllers on quad rotors and things like that. Uh, usually what will happen is you will get a lot of overshoots, okay. Like in linear systems, when you are talking about a linear system, you design a linear controller, uh, you can quantify how much is the overshoot. Right, you can actually say I want this much overshoot accordingly, I will choose the PID gains using some transfer function ideas and all that. You can actually compute what is the overshoot, you can actually control the gain so that the overshoot is you know minimized and things like that. In the nonlinear case, there is no such equivalent, okay, that you can that how much can you overshoot and it is a nonlinear system, right? It can actually throw you out before coming back in, all right. So it's a possibility that there will be overshoot. So we see a lot of overshoots and then gain tuning is not very easy. So this is another thing I get a lot of questions on how do I tune gains and things like that, okay. So, uh, so one of the key requirements in a lot of applications is that your state trajectories while they are tra the transient, basically until now we are only talking about asymptotic performance, okay. So that is what, so uh, until now only asymptotic guarantees yeah what does it mean it means that i am only saying that i will do this as t goes to infinity or that as t goes to infinity i'm going doing something nice as time becomes large okay so the big question is what about transients yeah so what happens to the transients all right so while i am converging to the good place how bad is my trajectory yeah this as you as you can see none of the theory that we have done until now does not really cover this. Yes, you have to you have to understand that because again we are using Lyapunov based design, we have always had something like V dot of x of t say 
is less than or equal to 0. At least we have had this, right? We had some kind of negative semi definite, which means that we have v of x of t is less than or equal to v of x of t0, correct? And this gave us some kind of ellipsoid, right? I mean, this is this what does this mean? This means that uh, in terms of your uh, right in terms of your yeah in terms of your real world systems what does it mean it means that i sort of got a ellipsoid in which my states will remain okay now this ellipsoid could be of any size right i mean it's not being yeah, it is governed by your initial conditions right here, right. But suppose your initial conditions were large, you started with a large offset, yeah, not that uncommon. Suppose you are very far from your desired trajectory, so you started with a large offset. So, and this is your ellipsoid that is governed by this, this ellipsoid is actually nothing but uh, V, uh, well, let us see, uh, this is actually ellipsoid is if you like this terminology, yeah, it's it's weird notation. But all I'm saying is, it's like if you compute v x t zero, it's some constant value, right? Because it's v is mapping to scalars, that's some constant value, right? And if you take v inverse of that, this is the shape you might get. Yeah, you could get some other shape also. I'm not saying it has to be an ellipsoid, but I'm saying it is some shape, some closed set. Right, because it's a inverse of some constant. Okay, because say if for example, if I think of v as x one square by two plus x two square by four, right? Then I want so this is this set is something like equal to some constant. Right, so you can see this is some kind of an ellipse equation. Right, so ellipsoid ellipse equation. And similarly, if you do more, you can get some general versions of ellipsoid. Now the point is if your initial conditions were rather large or initial errors were rather large because this can be in terms of x or it can be in terms of error depending on how the problem is posed, right. Then this ellipsoid is large, right. Now what happens in the future? Uh, later on all I am saying is I am restricted inside this set and nothing more, right. So my states can be anywhere here, right. I mean in the sense that all I am saying is at any instant in time, I am not going to exceed this ellipsoid, yeah, which can, if my trajectory, if my desired was this, yeah, if this is my desired, right, I want to sort of move here, yeah, uh, usually you will take origin as the desired, but do not worry about it, I am just giving you a representation, it may not be the truth, in error, in error variables, typically origin will be your desired always, that is how we have been working. But if you think reference trajectory, right, you should x minus r is equal to the error. So the r could be something in this blue, something like this blue thing, right. But I may be straying from this really far away, right. I could do this, try to reach it, but then I could go here, try to reach it, I could go here, and then eventually slowly I can reach, right. But I am going all the way to the end could I could potentially go all the way to the boundary right which means I am, my states are growing larger large in an attempt to reach the set okay so yes there is some bounds on the transients but they are not bounds that you might like yeah then there is another scenario where uh, there is a lot of um, safety critical applications. What is a safety critical application? I mean, one simple application is obstacle avoidance applications, okay. Suppose I have some uh, robot and I have these yeah, so I have this starting point and I have this end point, yeah, I want to go but I do not want to hit anything, okay. So now the robot, if, if I design a normal control, I have no way of specifying that I have to avoid these sets, right. There is no such thing, right. How do you specify it? There is no way. 
typically your normal control will probably just go here which it will not because there is an obstacle so it will hit the wall yeah that is a problem. So what do we want the controller to do? We want it to go here and then figure out there is an obstacle I see uh, yeah we want it to go here we want and figure out say okay fine there is an obstacle then do this maybe go here then do this and do here okay whatever whatever I mean I am not talking optimality here optimal path might be something like right I am not talking optimality here but I am saying that I want to at least avoid the obstacles right so if I see an obstacle I should turn now it should not be like I have to eh, of course you can do it the funny way where you can uh, see an obstacle give a trajectory which is around it and then start rotating around it and all that right that is of course one way but the other ways of course you can include it in the control design itself right so safety critical applications are basically saying that you have some reach or avoid sets you have some avoid sets or possibly you do not want the states to grow too large in the transients itself while it is trying to reach okay you want the states to behave nicely while it reaches okay and that is a requirement for almost any control yeah anything anything you do any trajectory tracking you will probably do not want to stray too far away from the desired yeah uh, unless because it may go out of your operational range sensors might be an issue everything might be an issue if you have too large velocities in a spacecraft that is a problem so you do not want to even in the transient stage exceed this okay so this is what sort of motivates the notion of um, barrier function for control okay so this is what we want to look at and there is a little bit of uh, theory we will cover yeah um, and let us see I will I will sort of try to motivate it initially if you look at this dynamical system it is just a dynamical system okay not a yeah there is no control yet okay as of now no control we want to talk about what these uh, barrier functions are right so the the idea is um, the idea is make uh, sets invariant okay or forward invariant forward invariant is forward in time invariant okay so until now our aim has been what to have stability and reach a point right reach a equilibrium right we did not try to make sets invariant although if you remember when we did all this lasalle theorem naturally there were some invariant sets okay so that is where uh, so um, let us see let us use that example also okay suppose I take again some v of x of t all right now suppose again there are uh, it has level sets of this kind this is one level set of v another another and so on right because so this will be something like v of x t equal to say c1 v of x t equal to c2 v of x t equal to c3 these are the sets because I already showed you how you draw and of course you would expect that uh, because it is smaller so you would expect by virtue of the fact that v is a Lyapunov function you would expect that what c3 will be less than c2 less than c1 right because it is inside so you expect that it is the case right now what do we do we start typically with Lyapunov function Lyapunov candidate maybe right vxt right and then what do we typically get we at least try to get something like v because if we did not get this I guess we achieved nothing right so obviously let us assume we got this so therefore at this point this became a Lyapunov function itself okay now like I showed you before the set which is defined by uh, so, so we already know that v x of t less than equal to v 
except T0 holds, right, because of this, right. So, what does it mean? It means that if I define my set omega C or omega say C1 as a set of all x such that V, well, I will just say Vx less than equal to C1, yeah. what is this set? This set is just the outer ellipse, right, is the outer ellipse, okay, is invariant under what condition? What do I need for this set to be invariant using this Lyapunov function? I only need that Vx T0 right is that fine right because i already have that vx is less than vx t0 and if vx t0 is less than c1 i am good okay okay all right all right all right great now now uh, one of the issues so this is so i got invariants right this is actually invariant right because forward in time invariant if I start inside this v x equal to c 1 set I am going to stay inside it ok all right. Now suppose my initial conditions ok. So, this is assuming what my initial conditions are somewhere inside this guy somewhere inside this outer ellipse. Now, suppose my initial conditions were inside the inner ellipse. Okay, somewhere inside the inner ellipse, right. So, in that case, you can see that omega C3 is also invariant if Vx T0 less than equal to C3, correct. So, suppose I started inside the smaller ellipse then this becomes invariant which means I never escape this guy, right, never escape this guy. So, basically by this logic if you keep using this you will see that depending on initial conditions how it is chosen or in fact even by scaling the V itself you cannot you do not need to actually change initial conditions just by scaling the V itself you will be able to show that all these sets inside some larger ellipsoid are all invariant. So, once you start inside them that is what is invariance right, invariance means start inside a set remain inside a set ok that is invariance ok. Uh, so, so whenever you start inside you remain inside this set ok, but the point is this is not what we are necessarily looking for ok. So, it might so be the case that our set this guy is our safety set that is I want to remain only inside this larger ellipsoid that is my safety set, I am allowed to operate anywhere inside this larger region. But because of this Lyapunov style of construction, what happened is if I started inside this set, I never escape this, yeah, I do not even utilize the larger space, right, I do not go here and come back to origin, right, whereas I am allowed to, I am allowed to use the larger space, larger state space because I only want to keep this guy invariant, but because of the Lyapunov construction that I used right with positive definite function and then negative semi definite V dot, what happens is if I start here I remain only inside this set it which is governed by my initial condition not by a predefined set that I as a user you know defined right. Typically what how do you define your safety set or desired region of operation you decide it predefine it you do not base it on your initial condition, initial condition can be anything right, but it is you do not base your safety critical set on where you started. So, so because of this kind of con construction you will always stay inside this set. So, you are actually wasting the ability to work here yeah, which might in some cases be what you desire actually yeah, you might need more control effort to always stay inside yeah, you might be allowed to get out and then come back in that is ok because as long as you are remaining in the larger set but this does not allow it ok. So, we want to look at constructions 
which will allow us to make one set forward invariant, but everything inside is not forward invariant necessarily. Okay, so that is what we are looking to do with barrier functions. Okay.